Well, hello, 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 everyone, uh, to another Sunday Toolbox Tech Talk here with Glenn Morris at the Smart Energy Lab. Great to have you all back on a Sunday. Uh, it's uh, been a pretty regular feature for much of the last half of last year and, and now the beginning of this year. So I'm really getting to the swing of these things. Uh, my partner said, are you ever going to have a Sunday off? I think I will be doing some pre-records actually so I get to have a weekend away sometimes. But uh, these days I quite enjoy doing these live events. And what tends to happen is um, topics come up throughout the week. Um, installers or solar industry, people ask me stuff. And, you know, I kind of think like, rather than just answering it for one person, why don't I turn it into a toolbox tech talk? And that's kind of what came about today. So today is all about um, sizing uh, DC cables, particularly in solar applications uh, and or batteries. That's what we're going to be looking at. But uh, just to, to, for those who are new to um, the channels here, uh, welcome everyone, those coming in from YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, Periscope. It's great to see you all from those different uh, different channels. Um, please feel free to make some comments and ask questions. Now today, actually, I'm going to have some Q&A as part of today. Uh, you just got me here today, there's no guest. And so um, really um, think about stuff that you'd like me to um, talk about or answer. I'll do my best if it's live. I may even uh, use it for a follow-up toolbox tech talk. Uh, I'd also like to, to shout out to all those who've done my courses before and who've really helped me learn a lot of stuff. Um, they say the best way to learn something is try and teach it, and that's really been true for me. Uh, people ask, or my students ask, the hard questions, and I have to find out the answers. And so that's kind of what uh, today's all about, is finding out answers for you. Now, I have to give a credit straight up. Um, I was inspired by a technical article written by GSES, Global Sustainable Energy Systems, uh, those who uh, are in Australia will probably well know GSES. And they wrote an article on DC cabling sizing using ASNZS 3008 and uh, also its limitations. Now, um, uh, I'm not doing a direct copy of their technical article. I'm just pointing you to it. So uh, I'll just throw it up on screen so you can see here. Uh, this is the article they produced. And uh, you know they've got some really good engineers there at GSES. Uh, and they've uh, done a great job of explaining the complexities of cable sizing, uh, particularly when it comes to AS uh, NZS 3008. Now, for those of you who are familiar with this standard, the standard was actually written um, you know, predominantly for AC cables, but it does say uh, and other. So it does actually uh, can be used for sizing DC. DC has a bit of a, a secret advantage though. Um, with DC you don't have uh, skin effect and you don't have proximity effect. So um, the fact there's no frequency or virtually none, there's a bit of ripple sometimes, means you don't get what's called the skin effect uh, in a DC system. And skin effect is uh, the phenomena that as frequency increases, less of the current actually flows through the centre of the conductor and and, um, uh, and therefore you start to use more and more of this the outside skin um, to the point where at radio frequencies, for instance, almost nothing flows through the centre of a conductor, hence uh, you know, cables used in, at radio frequencies are often just a tube because there's no point having a solid conductor, nothing's going to go through the middle of it anyway. Um, so that's just a little bit of background on 3008, it's not just for AC cables but uh, if you use the D ratings uh, given in 3008 for a AC, uh, it will also give you a little bit more headroom. Um, I'm not sure what the figure would be but uh, there's a small, small advantage with DC. Now, the focus today, actually, I thought I'd make it uh, very personal. It's about a system that we designed here at the Smart Energy Lab. Uh, it's a 67 kilowatt solar tracking system um, provided by Arctech Solar and Longy Solar. Uh, Longy provided the panels and Arctech Solar provided the, uh, the tracking system. And I think I've got a picture here. I just might bring that up. There you go. Uh, that's me. Uh, that's about one quarter of the system. That's sort of one half of one of the trackers uh, that... That motor you can see there, the orange motor, is what turns that shaft. And that shaft uh, is orientated north-south. And each of the modules are the, your large area utility scale modules, your 1 by 2 metre roughly, uh, the 435 watt uh, long E solar. Um, half of them are bifacials. Those are the bifacials you can see there, though you wouldn't know because you can't see the back of them. And the other half are 
um, perk monofacials. And actually part of the project really is a demonstration of the effects of bifacial versus monofacial, uh, considering the amount of albedo that you might get off landforms. Now, this is a grassy paddock. It will be green during the winter months and uh, at the end of summer quite light and dry, so the albedo or the reflected light will increase. But what I've been amazed by is the amount of albedo from fog. You know, so, uh, we've been getting some tremendous output of the system on what I would have thought was a really rubbish day, just foggy. And uh, of course, in fog conditions, the back of the panel is receiving almost the same amount of light as the front, uh, certainly when it's at a steeper incline. So early in the morning and late in the afternoon, particularly early in the morning, it's getting a lot of back reflection. So um, yeah, that's... Uh, that's the, the system. Uh, there is also uh, some um, inverters involved in this system. Now, if I can bring this up, let's see if I can just uh, play this for you. Let's have a look. Okay, so these are the Select Sun inverters uh, supplied by Selectronics. So this project actually is a collaboration with uh, quite a few companies. Selectronic provided four of their 20 kilowatt uh, Select Sun, sun inverters, and that's um, a construction photo that's not wired up yet. Of course, the AC and DC hasn't been wired on this unit uh, in this picture, but. Um, yeah, you get the idea. Uh, each of those is a single MPPT, by the way. That's uh, the way the select suns work. Um, they uh, uh, have quite a high current input, of course, to, to match that single MPPT, but uh, the 40 kilowatt units have dual MPPT. So we've got effectively one quarter of each of the array to each of those inverters, and uh, we've got underground cabling, so 16 mil XLPE uh, going out 220 metres out into a paddock where the arrays are. Uh, there are DC isolated at both ends of that cable. There's also lightning surge protection. Um, there's a uh, a weather station out in the paddock, which is part of the Arctec system, uh, it monitors uh, wind speed and direction, and if it gets to be a dangerous uh, wind speed, it actually parks the panels, uh, nose into the wind. So it's pretty clever how it manages the tracker actively. Apologies for the mess. We're, this is a construction photo, so against the side of a shed. Uh, it's not a finished, uh, finished product, but anyway. So, um, yeah, let's, let's uh, look at... Um, uh, we're going to look at this... Uh, system design. Now, I'm gonna, I've done some drawings, some single line drawings, and I've applied the principles of uh, AS3008 in terms of derating for both um, uh, method of installation and also derating for things like soil temperature um, and, and, and berry depth, etc. And we'll, we'll look at how you apply those. But I can see Ray, good day, Ray. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, do they have a hybrid to work with wind gens? Um, I don't know. Sorry. Um, not not uh, much of an expert on wind. We've got a few different wind turbines here, but uh, really the small demonstration units. Um, the larger one that was installed about 35 years ago uh, has long since died. Uh, it's a bit of a history of wind. It doesn't like being in a windy place like here. <laughs> yeah, up for a lot of maintenance. Yeah, anyway, um, so... Uh, I'd also like to remind people that I do run training courses here at the Smart Energy Lab. Uh, up until COVID, it was always a face-to-face -face course, uh, typically a five-day course, uh, residential, and it was uh, designed to take you from woe to go uh, for designing and installing a solar and battery storage system, whether it's on-grid or off-grid. But what I've been doing for the last year basically is delivering uh, the theory components online in a various and a range of ways. So I've been doing uh, a longer form courses, which are five half days. Um, that course actually starts on Monday. So I'm being, uh, if you're really keen and you'd like to enroll, you still can. There's still places. Uh, just go to solarquip com and you can enrol in that course uh, so it's delivered online 8 30 in the morning uh, melbourne time uh, for four hours and it's recorded so what i do is i record all my training now and then provide the recordings uh, to the participants um, later in the same day so a lot of people can't make all of the uh, uh, sessions so they get to watch the recordings in fact i get students from all around the world i've had a few from africa who are getting up in the middle of the night basically uh, to watch the course and um, i guess they might fall asleep or something so it's quite handy that there's a recording. Um, yeah, so I also run courses for electrical inspectors or those who are interested in the standards. So I've done uh, shorter courses, three-day courses on the solar battery and inverter standards and uh, a, a sort of a masterclass on the battery standard as well. So those courses are all listed on uh, my website, solarquip.com. 
yeah, g'day, Michael. Good to good to see you. Um, okay, so let's jump into it. And I've got some drawings here, which I'll just bring up. So I'm just going to cut over to my drawing, and there we go. So. And this looks awfully complicated because I've been working on it. Uh, it's quite a bit of maths involved, but I'm going to break it down into, into small sections for you. So as you would have seen from the photo at the beginning, um, what we've got is um, 156 panels uh, consisting of 12 strings of 13. So each string is 13 panels long. Uh, there is uh, uh, groupings of, uh, of three strings uh, grouped together, so we've got three strings going on to uh, one cable uh, and then going off to inverter, so a total of um, 12 strings in this system. And the distances, uh, we've got an underground length here of 220 metres, so the cables from the paddock back to um, one of the labs is 220 metres uh, buried in the ground, uh, 600 millimetres deep, so direct burial, so not in conduit, just direct burial with guarding above it, all the requirements, uh, that's uh, for buried cable. And that cable is XLPE, which is 90 degree rated, um, and the, the, the conductors are spaced in that trench and they're surrounded by sand and the soil type is a, a loamy, um, rotted day site. So all of that information will is actually relevant. We'll come back to that in a second. When it comes to the array, all the cables are in possibly the best cooling environment imaginable, which is on a catenary behind the panels. So a catenary is a, a tensioned wire, basically, and um, all of the string cables, and the longest ones are 90 metres long, uh, because the, the panel, the uh, tracker is 90 metres long. So 90 metres um, of catenary on the, the first three strings, and then progressively as they get closer to where the marshalling um, box is, um, the aggregation point, uh, we've got 67 and a bit metres, 45 and 22 metres. Uh, the, the cable, the string cables are all six millimetre squared uh, solar DC cable and uh, therefore I've put the dimensions here and uh, this is, of course, a single line diagram, so I'm not showing positive and negative. Now, because of the combinations of three parallel strings, uh, and this was covered in a previous Toolbox Tech Talk that you need to consider the relationship between short circuit current uh, and the series fuse rating of a module to determine whether string over current protection is required. And because these are high current panels, as you can see, um, this is the bifacial panels, they're 10.5 amps IMP, but um, uh, at uh, ISC they're 11.16, so that means uh, three panels um, will give us something like 33 amps. It, when it comes to string over current protection, you just subtract one string, and if the sum of the remaining strings, in this case um, uh, 11.16 times 3 minus 1 is 22.32 amps, so 22.3 amps, is greater than the series fuse rating of one module, and therefore that triggers the requirement for string over current protection. Uh, so there you go. That's why we have these fuses here. So we've got um, a 20 amp fuse on both poles uh, of all the strings. That's what they are. This is the isolator adjacent uh, to the array, and this is the isolator adjacent to the inverter. So we've got isolation at both ends. Because of the distance too, you really uh, you do want to be working safe when you're out in the paddock. You want to be able to isolate uh, at this generation source, and that's a requirement of our PV array standard 5033. So let's dive into the sizing con um, considerations. Now, um, one of the, the first things that you want to do is make sure that your cables can carry um, the maximum current of the system. And cable sizing um, has to consider uh, overload as well. So one of the requirements of the PVRA standard is that the um, short circuit current of the panel times 1.25, or the array times 1.25 is the minimum current carrying capacity of the cable. So uh, we find that the, um, the, the panels have 11.16 amps for the bifacials, and down the bottom here I've done the calculations uh, for the 
mono perks, which is just slightly more. I mean, this is kind of surprising. Um, you would have thought bifacials would have a higher current rating having two faces, but um, uh, that's not necessarily the case. They might produce more power when there's um, um, high albedo, and so this is uh, when there's no albedo applied. So 11.26 um, is for the mono perks, and 11.16, I'll just concentrate on the top one because it's probably easiest to see, for the bifacials. Um, we multiply that by 1.25 um, and that brings us up to uh, 13.95 amps per string cable. Now, there's a clause in 3008, ASNZS 3008, the, the standard for cable selection, um, which says that derating doesn't need to be considered where the current carrying capacity is greater than 35% of the test current or the rated current. Now, the, the, this cable, this 6mm cable, um, is capable of carrying um, 58 amps. Now, how did I get that number there? I got that from uh, uh, from 3008. I looked up in the appropriate table for um, not, uh, spaced not touching because these, pan these uh, cables are spaced from each other and they're not touching a surface. They're basically on a catenary in fresh air. You couldn't come up with a better way to keep a cable cool. It's not even in the sun because the because the panels are tracking. They're always blocking the sun from from the um, cables behind them. So um, because we've got a current carrying capacity on our six mil cables of fifty eight amps, um, the eleven uh, sorry the thirteen point nine five amps uh, which we are using as our test current is less than 35% of the current carrying capacity of a 6 mil cable, therefore we don't have any further derating uh, to consider. Um, the next step is going along um, this pathway is to look at um, the undergrounds. So and this is where it does get more complicated. So 3008 provides you with a whole bunch of tables. It's a little bit daunting at first, um, but once you get used to where you have to go, um, I hang around table five a lot, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, it, uh, you choose the installation methodology and therefore um, the current carrying capacity of standard cable sizes. But when you're bearing cable, extra deratings come into play. Now, um, it's surprising, de de bearing for a start actually significantly increases the current carrying capacity of a cable. You'll notice down here it's 139 amps for this 16 mil cable, which is you know nearly double what it's normally rated at. But you have to derate the soil based on other factors as well. And these are things like, what's the soil's maximum ambient temperature? Now, here at Mount Tullibawong, it's a pretty cool kind of place, but maybe in summer we might get up to 30 degrees, and I doubt if that's very deep, but that'll be the highest temperature we'd probably get on the soil. Uh, and so we look up in the deratings, I think it's table 39 from memory, um, for soil temperature and so uh, we do rate it by 0.97 uh, because we've buried the cables at uh, 600 mils deep or 0.6 of a meter the derating for that is 0.98 and uh, because the thermal resistivity of the soil is de determined by the soil type so if, is it dry sand or wet clay wet clay having a very good conductivity for heat whereas dry sand a poor conductivity for heat there are derating factors um, so it turns out that our soil um, has a, a very modest 1.2 degrees Celsius metres per watt and therefore it's actually a derating factor of one, uh, nothing. So we multiply those three together and get a total derating of 0.95. So that's what we've got to apply over here. Now, so there's the formula for the amount of current that our cable's got to carry uh, and... We've got three strings feeding each of those underground cables. So we've got 11.16 amps times three, three strings, times our, um, our overload margin of 25%. And then we derate all of that further by dividing by our um, total derating, 0.95, which remember we got from over here. There's our, our total derating over here. Uh, and that means that we, this cable needs to be able to carry 44 amps. So we do a sanity check at this point. Um, is the 16 millimeter cable we select big enough? Um, yes, it can carry 139 amps. So we're, we're well clear of the maximum current carrying capacity of this cable. Um, you might think, well, why didn't we go for a smaller cable? 
But this is where step two comes in. Uh, there are two challenges. One is not to melt the cable, which is why you have to calculate the current carrying capacity and select the cable for a minimum of that, uh, a size for, for, for the rated current. But you also have to consider voltage drop. So voltage drop next. Uh, not many questions coming in here, so feel free to, to make some comments uh, and some questions. Um, and, you know, like everyone on um, <laughs> on YouTube and Facebook, etc., we love to get a, a thumbs up or, a, um, you know, uh, a, some positive comments if you're enjoying today's Toolbox Tech Talk. All right, so now this one is uh, probably a little bit light on the pencil side. I might zoom in on it for you in a second, but uh, I just want to show this is the formula for voltage drop. It's actually very simple compared to AC because really um, you're just measuring the DC resistance of a cable uh, and that's calculated by um, twice the root length. Now, root length is uh, how far you walked when you dragged the cable out, basically. That's the, the amount of cable you pulled off the drum. Um, that's the, the root length. And of course, it's a loop. That's the two times because it's there and back. And then you need to um, consider the resistivity of that conductor. And that's where you look that up in a table. Uh, and uh, to get the percentage voltage drop, we need to know what the operating voltage of the system is. That's VMP. Uh, and the the multiplying factors is to bring it into a percentage. Um, okay, yes, thanks, uh, <laughs> Facebook user. Why not make a mistake on purpose and see if anyone picks it up? Usually I make a mistake not on purpose and someone picks it up. So <laughs> it's probably going to happen anyway. Um, so feel free to, to point out any errors that you might note. Um, I've put down the bottom here uh, what each of those are, ISC for short circuit current. Now, this is something that changed my thinking after reading the article from GSES on cable sizing. I always used IMP, or current at maximum power, when doing voltage drop calculations because it's actually, while it's working, is what you want to know what the voltage drop is. When there's a short circuit, by definition, there is no voltage. It's zero volts at a short circuit. But the, the rationale in, in doing this calculation is that you won't always have have uh, perfect conditions. As the panels heat up, uh, you'll lose some power. Um, so to accommodate that sort of natural underperforming, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the drop in, in uh, current due to a higher temperature and or reduction of power anyway. Uh, therefore, the VMP is going to droop a bit when the panels are hot. So by using the ISC, you've kind of put in a, you know, a bit of a safety margin uh, for re reduced VMP due to temperature. So that's why it's ISC, not IMP. Apologies to my former students, I always put IMP in there, um, but this is uh, a good rationale, so I'll, I'll stick with IC going forward. It's really not much difference, actually. It's only about 5 or 6%. The... Um Root length down here. Now, the resistivity, you can look that up in uh, table 39 of uh, ASNZS 3008, and it's given in ohms per kilometre. So that's the resist resistivity of the cable. So let's zoom in on one of these calculations. So I'm just going to zoom in a bit more here so you can see it more clearly. And what I've done... Um, uh, sorry, I've got a question in there. Training Gate asks, um, hang on, let me just bring that on. Thank you. Uh, Training Gate asks, would you factor temperature derating into voltage drop calculations? Well, um, I guess Training Gate, the, the answer to that is that the, the ISC uh, being used instead of the IMP is a way of factoring in temperature derating. Uh, that's certainly the uh, intent given in the article that GSES published. Um, I guess you could be a bit more scientific about this and that um, if you knew uh, what the effect of the temperature is uh, on VMP, you would actually uh, calculate it and put the true VMP. So you could do this, for instance, you know, at... Uh, So if you knew what the ambient is, you could back calculate what the cell temperature is and therefore calculate the VMP. So, yeah, good point, um, Training Gate. And when that really becomes important, by the way, and I was, I've got another drawing to explain voltage drop and why sometimes it's not an issue. Uh, voltage drop is about power loss primarily. So uh, as the volts droop, you're basically um, sending more uh, energy into the cable and less of, it, less of it into the load. 
so it's a lost uh, a certain amount of lost power, but it's also about reliability. Um, so it's inverters have a most grid connect inverters anyway have a, a minimum um, operating voltage. Uh, so if you droop too far uh, in that range, you can uh, drop right out, out of it, and uh, therefore um, it will no longer. Uh, track the the array's maximum power. So you can drop out of the maximum power uh, point window and go into a less efficient zone. Now, incidentally, we are ex experiencing that at the moment on the array um, because we haven't yet got the whole array connected. We're, because of um, <laughs> because of issues around the 600 volt limit for domestic, we've actually configured it as strings of 10 for the short term um, until we get approval to go up to uh, over 600 volts. So that's a, a little bit of a problem, but it still works. We're just dropping out of the MPPT efficient range uh, on a warm day. But anyway, let's go back to the perfect design here. Uh, so array cable is the cable that's the underground cable, the 220 metre long cable, and the string cables are the cables on the catenary attached to the back of the modules. Uh, so we start by looking at the losses on the string cable. Now, um, I've done that, the calculations for each of the array cables. We've actually got four of them, um, two are for the bifacial panels and two are for the mono perks uh, and hence they've got slightly different characteristics in terms of current and I've used the formula here and inserted the values for the modules and calculated uh, what the loss is. Now you'll see it's quite high. It's 4.3% on the array cable for the bifacials and 4.3% also for the monos. There's a very small difference um, for the mono perks. Now some of you might straight away say that's way too much um, ASNZS 5033 says a maximum of 3%. Well, actually, the wording is should, not shall, should. Uh, safety standards like 5033 make a big difference, um, make a distinction between something that's unsafe, and that will always be a shall. If something is unsafe, you shall not do it. But if something is not recommended, uh, it's often a should. You should do this um, to avoid you know, for instance, uh, a yield loss. Now, when it comes to um, solar generation, really, it's a self-inflicted loss. You can choose how much of it you're going to heat the ground uh, uh, and therefore, you know, how much waste there was, there's going to be uh, in that cable. So this figure could have been reduced. I could have gone from 16 mil cable to the next size up, like 25. But because of the cable runs, um, you know, we had nearly a kilometre of cable, um, the cost was starting to get a little bit steep. So I actually made an economic decision to allow for a little bit more loss. We would still achieve the outcome we needed in terms of the amount of renewable energy uh, going into um, a island microgrid. Now remember this is not um, grid connected, this system, or I didn't even tell you that, but some of you will know that. It's not grid connected. It's an islanded microgrid uh, powering seven homes and my uh, labs here at the Smart Energy Lab. Um, so I didn't really mind a little bit of waste because almost every sunny day um, we just waste half the day, uh, i.e. Uh, the panels are curtailed because the batteries are full and the loads are insufficient. So we already have too much power, um, so curtailing is not an issue. Um, so yeah, i uh, got a comment here from Stephen. Hello Stephen, g'day. Uh, interesting your consideration of the domestic 600 volt rule in an off-grid situation. Surely your training centre is not domestic. Well tell you the truth Stephen, I assumed that too because it's uh, it's certainly not a habitable building, no one lives in my labs, they're t t not attached to any um, residential homes, uh, though they're on the same property as some residential homes. So this is an off-grid community of 30 homes, uh, it's on 245 hectares of land. Um, the the panels are you know 200 meters from the nearest house, uh, but uh, when you look carefully at and certainly in Victoria the requirements around the definition of residential it comes down to what type of building uh, approvals have been given. So because the type three building or the the rating of this site by the council is type three. That sits us into the domestic range, unfortunately. So um, we didn't quite escape um, just by saying, well, it looks commercial. It's not on a home. Therefore, it's, uh, you know, that's, it's non-domestic. Uh, that's not the case. But um, things may change in the future. So I'm optimistic that the um, 600 volt limit might go away. Um, <laughs> but uh, if not, we will apply for an exemption. So that's a, a, bit, of a, a bit of a job um, to get a ruling from energy 
as you say, Victoria. So uh, I might just wait and see what happens this year in terms of standards. Um, yeah, thank you, Stephen. So going back to this cable sizing, um, there's two losses really. There's the loss underground uh, in the array cable, and I've calculated it at 4.3%, and there's the losses in each of the string cables. And since uh, two sets of string cables go into one array cable, I've drawn a line showing how they connect together. So um, uh, there's the array cable connected to this string and this string, and this array cable here, uh, here, this array cable here connected to these strings. And so I've put down the percentage losses, accumulative losses, by adding together the array cable loss and the string cable loss and come up with um, a total figure for each inverter. And so these are losses on each of the four inputs to each of the inverters. And just for fun, I've converted that into watts so you can see you know, what the losses are in watts. Now remember, um, this is a 67 kilowatt um, PV array uh, at standard test conditions. So our total losses, and if I kind of move my head out the way, here we go. I'll see if I can move my, uh, have I locked it? Why is it? Why can't I move my head? I um, know oh, I can't move my head. I have to turn off the little picture in picture thing. But anyway, um, easier way is to move the paper. The total losses da -da -da -da, is, <laughs> is around uh, 3.5 kilowatts. Now that would be at full power, of course. So, um, 3.5 kilowatts. But I, one thing I've discovered with the tracking system is <laughs> full power is actually 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> it's, it's really insane, uh, the, the performance of a tracking system. So uh, there it is there. Um, it'll be perpendicular to the sun as soon as it gets over the trees. And at this time uh, of the year in summertime, that's about 8, 8 820, I think, at the moment, actually. Uh, and those panels will be perpendicular to the full sun and bang, we've got full power. So uh, it really cranks uh, from morning till afternoon uh, right down to sort of like 7 o'clock, 7.30 o'clock at night. So it's really like just switching on a generator that runs at, at full power the whole day long. Um, you actually see a little bit of a dip in the middle of the day because of heat. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful generation profile tracking. Anyway, so back to, uh, back to the diagrams and I'll just bring that back up for you. So I guess I've kind of finished this voltage drop calculation for you and therefore just to, to re-emphasize that it is not a safety issue, it's a performance loss. You can choose um, how much loss or you can calculate how much loss but you can select cables to avoid that. Now um, if I wanted to reduce the losses here to say half this, I basically double the cable size. So I go from like 16 mil, uh, 35 mil, and I would have um, halved the losses in the cable because uh, the, the cable size is the almost directly proportional to losses in, uh, in terms of voltage drop. So there you go, we've sized for current and we've sized for voltage drop and we've used the tables out of ASNZS3008. For those not familiar with this standard, by the way, um, you can purchase it from Standards Australia. Um, it's a, a very important uh, document as a, an installer to have a copy of because you will be constantly referring to those tables. It's not like, you know, the wiring rules, once you've got it under your belt and you've learnt the clauses, you remember them, you won't remember the tables. So the tables are, are pretty much imperative to have a copy of those. So um, uh, next up, oh, I've got a question from LinkedIn user. Um, hang on, just bring that one on screen. Uh, what is the maximum length you consider a single string cable length, a single string? Well, in our case, it's 90 metres. Well, to be absolutely correct, it's a bit over 90 metres because that's the length of the, uh, the tracker and then it'll drop down uh, to the ground and go a few metres to the uh, to the combiner box, so maybe it's 95 metres or something like that. Um, I mean, strings are what they are. Certainly in ground mount systems, they can be very, very long. Uh, so you've, you've got to consider the layout of your um, ground mount system when you're considering string links because uh, you don't really want to have massive cables dangling off the back of your panels. Uh, so you might find better ways of stringing them and have more points of combining. So I hope that answers your question, uh, LinkedIn user. Thank you. Okay, um, what have I got up next? Oh yeah, so this is really a bit of a thought bubble because um, you know uh, there has been uh, many questions given to me around um, uh, 
voltage drop, but I just want to make the point that actually it's more about power loss when you consider uh, the the benefits within a system in terms of the benefit of a PV system. And so what I've done here is just shown a system that has two parallel strings with quite different size cables, 4 millimeter and 10 millimeter cables, uh, and different, um, uh, different voltage and power uh, operating points, and how at a commenting point, we can calculate what the combined current will be. So we've actually combined 30 amps and 10 amps to get 40 amps. Uh, then we've dropped our cable size down to 6 mil. And so for each of these segments, I've done a separate voltage drop calculation. There they are there. And uh, segments A, B and C. And then I've calculated the power loss on each of those segments and worked out the total power loss. So... Yes, voltage drop is important, certainly from a reliability point of view, um, but power loss is a yield consideration. Um, what is the yield of your system being reduced due to just heating conductors? So that's another way of looking at um, cable sizing for PV systems. Now I've got a couple more questions coming in here. Um, uh, the question is, do you recommend any software to assist with cable sizing? Uh, I'm probably not the right person to ask that, Training Gate. Um, I have used various apps, but they're not very transparent. Like, I don't actually know what the assumptions they're making are. And when you look at the level of detail that you can go into, especially in, in the tables for derating uh, in AS, NZS 3008, uh, I don't know if those apps really consider all those possibilities. So, you know, there's over 20 um, columns in some of those tables for the different methods of, of attaching or, or um, enclosing cables and locating them. So, you know, you've got to consider all of those factors. So I think um, at an upper level, they're probably just a, you know, ready reckoner, not really engineering grade, but no doubt there are engineering tools that do this as well. Um, but I like to teach the principles so you can take it from first, first principles before you start using software. Um, Ray, thanks Ray. Ray says that uh, Red Arc, who's a South Australian based company, um, have some information on, on um, cable sizing, so thanks for that. And uh, yes, you can always use manufacturers to get some of this data too, because they often will have tested their cables. Um, so uh, that might be a very useful way to, um, to get some more detailed information. Um, there is an, other methodologies uh, for calculating current carrying capacity and, and voltage drop, which uh, would fall outside of the scope of N ASNZS 3008. And um, the article from GSES makes the point that um, th uh, 3008 really is focused on um, uh, systems with less than 20 conductors um, bundled together. But when you're talking utility scale solar, you will have more than 20 conductors bundled together. So some of those deratings won't be good enough, and so you would need to consider um, higher levels of derating. They don't consider, 3008 doesn't consider multi-tiered trenching, where you've got uh, quite a deep trench with um, so different thermal characteristics at different depths. Uh, it only goes up to uh, 0.6 and 1 kilovolt. Uh, so for um, utility scale solar goes up to 1500 volts DC. Uh, that's, so that's another limitation. And it doesn't consider the temperature inside enclosures, just within wiring systems, not within um, switchboards and combiner boxes, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, it also doesn't give you a lot of detail around thermal resistivity, particularly when it comes to, to soils. So some of these would be testable if you actually knew, for instance, on a solar farm, uh, what the thermal resistivity of the soil is, you could do a, a more detailed assessment. Uh, there are thermal um, modelling software, I believe. I'm not familiar with it. Um, and there is also the ERA report, which is for current rating standards of distribution cables. That's, um, uh, I think, report 69-30. Uh, and that in parts 3 and parts 5 gives you information on um, areas not covered by 3008. But what I should do is really point you back to um, that um, a publication from GSES, there it is there, so uh, um, don't want to sort of steal their, their thunder. They've actually done a lot of research on this and they teach this stuff. They also do engineer designs, so if you think it's above your skill set, you can actually get them to do these calculations for you. 
Uh, so that's the GSCS um, technical note paper. So this, I'll just take you to the top of the page so you can see it. There you go. Technical articles. They, they produce regular, uh, excellent technical articles. So, um, yeah, great a great resource to have. All right, I've got a little bit more coming up. And I do actually have... Um, a question from someone uh, who's not here or was not actually posted it live, but I'll come to that in a minute, which is to do with generators and uh, in, uh, connecting them via um, a plug and socket. So just that's just to whet your appetite. But what we're going to do next is go and look at a, a battery system problem. And so this is a problem that I've got. Um, what you're looking at here, and I probably should zoom in a bit more, is a... A large 48 volt battery system um, I'll just bring it down here so I've got 20 uh, these are power plus uh, power plus energy uh, eco or they're actually called the smart ecos um, because they've got a smart BMS and so there's there's 20 of them so 20 by 4 kilowatt hours uh, and that's a something what's referred to uh, colloquially here at the lab as the tower of power it looks pretty awesome it's in a data cabinet it's about two meters high 20 20 battery modules uh, and it provides the um, the energy storage for the smart energy lab and the microgrid that it's uh, running but because we've got 20 of them and each one has a double pole 63 amp circuit breaker on its output um, first point to note is that 63 amp um, circuit breaker meets the requirement of a battery isolator. Uh, it is actually a circuit breaker which can be locked in the off position. It's marked on and off uh, and it's load breaking. And if it's in a location that's readily accessible, now this is really important, readily accessible means without a tool. So if you put it in the cabinet and the cabinet's got a key in it, uh, it's no longer readily accessible if that, tea, that key could ever be removed. So I'd suggest if you're using cabinets that are lockable, you should unlock them and throw away the key because you, you want it to be readily accessible. Uh, the idea is that in the case of emergency, the system operator without any tools and any knowledge other than the shutdown procedure can turn that system off. They don't have to go looking for a key when the smoke's pouring out. Not that the smoke's going to pour out of these, but uh, you know, you've know you got to think about what can go wrong upstream. Uh, so these are actually the means of isolation adjacent to the battery. Uh, but because there's 20 of them in parallel onto a large copper bus bar in the back of the cabinet, we've actually got 1,260 amps of prospective fault current. Uh, that's huge. <laughs> and uh, I don't really need that much current because what it's powering is a um, six inverter power chain, a selectronic power chain. Um, so it's a selectronic power chain consisting of six uh, SPMC 481s uh, this is also a, a test site for Selectronic, so they've been doing some development with the power chain here. It's, it's quite mature and working beautifully. Uh, and we've also just added the AERL MPPT um, onto that system as well. So really, um, I don't need 1,260 amps of capacity. What I need is uh, 250 amps, because that's what each of these um, are going to draw at their maximum power, and uh, the MPPT has got a 63 amp breaker on it, um, but actually I think uh, we its maximum current's a little bit less than that, so uh, you know we really don't need much more than about 800 amps of capacity. So um, you know I've I've worked out that what would carry the current um, to provide the uh, uh, to supply the loads or when charging the batteries is really three 120 mil conductors uh, in parallel. Uh, here, not not enough to carry 1,260 amps, but I've got a problem. If I did have a short circuit here, those three 120 mil um, conductors aren't going to be carry the fault current, and uh, until all of those breakers trip, uh, I could exceed the thermal rating of the cable. So I've got to redesign this. So how do I do that? Let's have a look. What you do is you can break it into smaller segments. Now, um, what I've got is four subgroups of battery modules. So I've shown one group of five battery modules connected in parallel onto the bus bar. 
So we could cut the bus bar into four sections, for instance. Taking off at that point via a 200 amp fuse, primarily as a current limiting point, so that my cable sizes can drop down. So um, I've got a, uh, I can drop to a smaller cable size at this point. Now I looked up um, the, the rating for the 70 mil cable. The current carrying capacity is 204 amps. That's uh, from ASNZS3008, table 5, column 16, because this is uh, enclosed in um, a duct and the cables would be bundled. Um, and so I end up with four, so I'll just push this up a little bit so you can see, uh, four sub-modules rather than one big stack of 20 batteries all connected on the same bus bar. So it just means adding a few more fuses in there to, to limit the current. And then at the point of combining, I've got a couple of choices. I may end up with a short link that links to my um, point of isolation uh, for the inverters. Um, or I could actually go straight onto um, a, a common bus bar at the uh, at this point here. So this could be a copper bar in the bottom of this HRC fuse switch. Now some of you will have heard me um, rattle on about the fact that HRC fuse switches um, are out and that they're no longer suitable as battery isolators because uh, they're IP20, they're not IP23, which is the minimum under our new battery standard, ASNZS5033, uh, requires IP20. 23 for the isolator adjacent to the battery system um, and if the PCE or inverter is more than two meters away from the battery system you need an isolator um, load break isolator that's also IP23 if it's indoors and IP56 no water if it's outdoors um, but if for instance this selection of this HRC fuse switch is within two meters of the battery system, I've actually called this my main battery isolator um, uh, collection of breakers. As long as they're all listed in the shutdown procedure, to, so the shutdown procedure would say to isolate the battery system, turn off battery module isolators numbered 1 through 20, um, that would be the way of shutting down this system. And therefore, this here is really just about uh, a convenient way of installing some 250 amp fuses. It doesn't actually have to be an, um, a load break isolator. So you could replace these with uh, fixed fuses as opposed to a, a fuse switch, or you could use a circuit breaker that's suitably rated at this point as well. So there you go. That's the transition from um, uh, the, the previous system, which just had uh, too much current uh, to sensibly size my cables. That was the, that's the existing system uh, or how, how it was being uh, initially planned. But once we realise what the, the maximum current is going to be, it, it's uh, just too high and we don't want to oversize all our cables when we really only need 250 amps per phase. So we went to this. Okay, um, I've got time for some Q&A, but I've got one more thing. I think I'll bring it up here. Where are we? So this question came during the week, and I promised uh, the, uh, my former student um, that I would answer this because it's a little bit complicated. Now, the question came about... Um, oh, I should just bring myself up. Hang on. There we go. The question came, um, is there any legal way of having a plug-in generator in an off-grid system. Now, what that question really relates to is the fact that these days uh, most uh, interactive inverters are used off-grid are also the means of charging the batteries. So you don't have a separate battery charger from your main inverter. The inverter can take another source, another AC source, and charge a battery. And therefore, it's an interactive inverter in the sense that it parallels with another source while that source is available. So you start the generator, the interactive inverter senses that uh, there's another source available, synchronizes its waveform with it, and then can start to divert some of that to charge batteries and some of it to supply the loads. That's all very well. It's a great feature and it means that you get high-powered battery charging without having to buy a separate product such as a dedicated um, battery charging unit. But the problem is that um, you can't actually connect that generator via a socket inlet. Um, the reason for that is even though they're available, you can get socket inlets for caravans, for instance, with a 15 amp plug or higher rated ones, uh, and uh, plug your generator in using uh, the female end of, a, of a, an extension cord. But 
you're not compliant with ASNZS 5139. Now, there's a clause in ASNZS 5139. I'll just kind of flash it up on the screen for you, uh, which is all about uh, interactive inverters. And so when it, sa it says here, um, connection of generators to inverters, connecting a generator set in parallel with an interactive inverter, the electrical output of a generating set shall only be connected with an interactive inverter using fixed wiring. So fixed wiring is not a plug and socket. <laughs> it has to be permanent wiring. Um, that means that that generator is not going anywhere. It's permanently attached um, by fixed wiring to the interactive inverter. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, the most important reason is there is no test standard for those inverters to say how long those male pins on the socket inlet will be live for when you unplug it. Most inverters will drop their um, source paralleling contactor almost immediately you pull the, the plug out, but there's no test for it. So some of them are alive for a few seconds. That means as you pull that plug out and if you touch those pins, you could get an electric shock, potentially fatal electric shock. So it's a pretty serious safety issue. The other one is, uh, and this is probably more of a, a reliability uh, factor is that uh, you have to size your generator uh, in terms of its output power to suit the interactive inverter's maximum demand. And if the if the uh, interactive inverter can draw, let's say, um, you know, 20 amps, uh, you have to have a generating set that can supply 20 amps. So you get the right generator, you plug it in, it all works fine. But because it's plug and play. When, if you have a non-compliant plug-in um, generator, uh, that might change. For instance, the generator might go away, it gets used elsewhere, um, the, the customer goes, oh gee, I need to use a generator now, I can't find the original one, but I've got this little Honda, this little one kilowatt Honda, I'll plug that one in and see how we go. It will just overload that generator, possibly causing it to fail, uh, so it's a reliability issue as well. But the question that came in really was, um, is there a legal way that you can have a plug-in um, that's still safe? Well, uh, this is where it doesn't come down to is it legal or not, but it's a philosophical consideration. Now, we already have um, a parallel with inverters. We have uh, male connectors. And here's one here. This is a YLAN connector, very commonly the AC connection to a um, solar inverter. So just put the end so you can see it. So in here, this is um, the grid side of the connector. So this is potentially live inside there, but it's it's IP4X. That means I can't touch it. I can't touch those pins, even though they're live pins inside there and they're male pins, I can't touch them. Uh, and therefore, when I connect it into uh, the solar inverter, uh, there is no chance of backfeed. Uh, sorry, there's no chance of me touching live parts. Um, so there is, you know, products available that can achieve that level of uh, inherent safety. Um, but there, you've still got a problem, which is that these aren't rated necessarily uh, as load break devices. Um, they're designed to be used following a shutdown procedure. So there's a little a little um, problem there as well. Uh, sometimes people say, I know how to do it. I'll do it with contactors. And so I'll have a go at drawing this and explain why it won't work. So um, you might have a generating set here. And it's uh, got a socket. So here's a socket here, right? That's a socket, it's got three pins on the socket, and we've got a socket inlet over here, which connects to our inverter. Now, remember, it, that's just an inverter symbol, we know that's AC. And this is the load side. And this is the source side. Okay, so um, I'll just zoom in a little bit more for you so you can see that better. And of course, there's going to be a battery system here somewhere. So there's your battery. Okay, so uh, inverter. Um, the problem is that internally, even though there is a contactor inside here, so if I was to um, explode out this part here, what happens inside here? What happens inside here is there is um, a, a paralleling contactor. 
there's two of them. And so this is the load, this is the source, and this is inside the inverter. So the inverter actually has its inverter function connected via a contactor, so it can choose when it parallels with another source. This is important so that it can choose when to try and synchronise with another source. So normally what would be happening is when there's no generator running, this contactor is open and this one is closed. But when the generator is running, uh, it will monitor the frequency. So it will monitor the frequency, I'll choose a bit of colour, um, of the, when I say it, the inverter will monitor the frequency and the waveform of uh, the generator. So this is the generator waveform here. And it will monitor, uh, it will adjust its own frequency to be in sync. So this will be the inverter's frequency. And when they are at a zero crossover point and in perfect synchronization, this contactor will be closed by the inverter. The inverter controls that contactor uh, through its own internal um, electronics. So there's a little, little control cable basically operating that contactor. Now, many people say, well, you know, we can do much the same as this external to the inverter. We could actually have a contactor here that's um, powered from uh, another source it's powered from the the generator so when the generator is available that contactor will shut when the generator is not available it will open um, the problem with that is um, <laughs> we're using the same plug and they're they're not we haven't got a any extra pins so there is kind of a solution to this problem um, using what's known as a plug with pilot pins now um, Marichelle make these kind of plugs. Um, I've seen them used for, or I haven't seen them used, but I've seen them on their data sheet. They're often used for really high power applications as a, a load break disconnector. And the pilot pins are shorter than the power pins. So they're the last to connect and the first to disconnect as you unplug. And the pilot pins control whether that um, those uh, power pins are live or not because there's a a contactor behind them that is operated by the pilot pins. So if I was to draw in some pilot pins uh, into this system, I'd have these little stumpy pins here uh, in blue, which are pilot pins. And um, they, they, they don't mate until um, the socket is completely pushed in, uh, home and safe. So that is a, a methodology that could be um, used to achieve that level of safety in terms of no live parts um, uh, on uh, that are touchable on the socket inlet of the interactive inverter. The problem is, though, it still means that this generator can be taken away and replaced with the wrong one. So you've got the ability to kind of um, a reliability issue. Um, will the system always work? So you don't solve all the problems that that clause in 4509 addresses, which is you must connect the generator by fixed wiring because it's part of the whole system design. It's a bit like having a plug-in battery pack. You know, who knows what you might plug in there? It might be the wrong type of battery and therefore um, the system is uh, uh, unreliable or unsafe. So um, Facebook uh, user asks, I'll just uh, answer a couple of questions here and um, I think I'll wind up after this. Um, is, is that an SP Pro? Actually, there are many inverters that work this way. Sunny Island, um, Schneider XW Plus, XW Pro, um, the uh, Victron um, Multi Plus, the Victron Quattro, uh, Studer XTM. Uh, it is actually not unusual, particularly inverters designed for off-grid applications, to have uh, two, uh, a source input and a load input and can synchronise with another source. Uh, some can also be used on grid, so the source could be the grid instead of a generator. So uh, that's not that unusual, really. And uh, Ray says, what's Ray got to say? Apparently someone was using it to charge a Tesla via the wall connector, but it kept tipping out because of the neutral pin. Um, right, I'm not quite sure exactly what was happening there, but... Um, uh, apparently someone was using it to charge a Tesla via a wall connector. Or charge, I'm not sure what they were using. Um, Ray, maybe you could <laughs> add a little more content to that. But uh, thanks, Ray. Uh, actually, if you saw Toolbox Tech Talk last week, uh, where I interviewed um, Bryce Gatton, we actually talked a bit about um, uh, EVs, electric vehicles, uh, supplying the home or supplying the grid. 
or even supplying anything at all. So these were acronyms like V2H, vehicle to home, V to G, vehicle to grid, V to X, vehicle to anything. <laughs> um, all of these are things that are in the pipeline but aren't actually available in Australia yet because of our standards. Our standards don't yet allow vehicles to export power to a utility grid and a home or a home paralleled with a utility grid. Even though um, the technology exists, so certainly with Chatamo connectors and I believe in a couple of years Type 2 connectors will also have this functionality where you can um, take DC power uh, from the vehicle and supply the home or AC power from the vehicle and supply the home. Um, so uh, those things are certainly possible but not there yet for Australia. Um, so I think I've, I've covered all the material I wanted to, to cover today. Thanks for those who have attended and uh, next week I haven't yet got a topic. So Please feel free to, to in the comments, uh, say what you'd like to hear more about and I'll consider that in terms of my topics for Toolbox Tech Talk or any guests you'd like me to, to bring on to, to have a chat to. Um, and, and for those who saw my um, solar crypto mining, I'm definitely going to be bringing in some more people talking about um, crypto mining uh, with solar. It was such a popular Toolbox Tech Talk and uh, certainly got me into uh, thinking about how to use my surplus solar energy uh, in a way that uh, both soaked up that energy uh, a, a, and produced a bit of revenue uh, and helped um, helped give me some good profiling of my off-grid um, solar tracking system. So uh, that was great, and it was really good to have Carl Zilm on there. He uh, he uh, he he's really uh, been doing some interesting things with um, crypto mining, uh, GPUs, and uh, building some awesome-looking rigs. Okay, well, thanks everyone. I'll see you next week, same time, same place. I'm out.